<laughs> so shalom and welcome this is Wednesday afternoon Bible class it is April 28th and we are picking up in our gospel in the stars a study of God's astronomy not Satan's astrology world of difference and you will see we are not uh, having anything to do with Satan's warp of the truth but we excuse me do want to study the truth as a very quick review from the beginning since I have some new ones but in just short I encourage you go listen um, to the the YouTube bit.ly site that has the teachings because I can't you know we took classes to cover this but we saw that God put his message his gospel message the salvation plan into the stars we will see that as we look at the constellations as we look at some of the names of the stars going into the ancient Hebrew and Arabic and other languages that before there was a written word the stars were in place we see in, in Bereshit Genesis 15 5 and 6 that God showed it to Avraham when he went out and our English poorly just uses the word count the stars and people think that Abraham was told he was going to have a big family and God called him righteous well my question always is how does believing you're going to have a big family make you righteous <laughs> it doesn't righteousness comes solely and only in the shed blood of Yeshua Jesus and are coming into faith in him so what Abraham saw in the Hebrew it said narrate tell declare that's what he was God was walking him through the, the map or the chart of what was going to come in the stars he looked and saw the day of the Lord John 8 56 tells us that Yeshua himself spoke this word said Abraham saw my day and rejoiced he saw the day that the Lord was going to die for us he saw the day the Lord would resurrect from us he saw the whole eternal plan that's what he put his faith in he believed God that's what was counted for righteousness and the Hebrew is very clear that he believed in God and that's what was counted for righteousness not that he believed in the stars or in a big family although it was true God was also promising him seed but he was also promising him in that seed a specific singular seed Galatians 3 16 tells us that seed that God was promising Abraham is none other than Yeshua Jesus himself that he would come out of Abraham's loins Abraham is Abraham by the way so we know if we follow in the English Abraham Isaac Jacob Judah David we come down and if you want the genealogy in short go to Matthew Matthew chapter 1 yes it's the Brita Hadashah the New Covenant but it's written by a Jewish author because it's one book we should not divide it it's one that continues on we use and call it new covenant because it was promised by the prophet <laughs> Jeremiah Jeremiah that God was going to give a new covenant and the British Hadashah the new covenant teaches us about it but it was promised again in what's called the original that's a better word than old because it's not old as an antiquated but back on track when the Abraham saw it and, and declared, told, narrated, we see that very same Hebrew word is in Psalm 19, verse 1. The heavens declare the glory of God. They're telling about the glory of God. Hebrews 1, 1 through 3 tells us the glory of God is the express radiance of God that is brought to us in <coughs> the form of Yeshua Jesus. That Jesus is actually God himself, so it's more than a mirror image. It's more the, the, more an exact, I don't even want to use the word copy because he's not a copy of God, he is God. So my English just does not give me a word. But the heavens are declaring who he is, telling us about him, telling us about his glory. And again, we see also that Romans 4 told us that Abraham was justified by his faith, his faith in this, not in his works, not in anything else, his faith in believing what God revealed to him. This is how Enoch, seventh generation from Adam, knew about the second coming of Yeshua Jesus that still a, a time off from from where we are right now and yet Enoch knew about it and he knew about it before he could pick up what we call a Bible and read it in the Bible so we see that there's much evidence in Scripture that they were aware of the the star the story in the stars and that's what we're taking a look at also 
Um, the only way that it sounds like astrology is we do use the word zodiac, but zodiac is simply the path of the sun through these constellations. And we see that the moon circles through every 30 days, and that gives us our different constellations, our parts, our separations. And so because of that, people think, oh, okay, now you're studying astrology. No, that's still astronomy. It's what Satan takes that to mean and warps it that comes out to astrology. But we do see the movements, and we are even told that the, um, the, the lights in the sky in the day and night were for appointed times, for seasons, for signs, as well as for light. Sign is significant. It's signifying something. And we, we looked heavily at that um, to, I think we did. I think we did before. I sometimes forget what I'm going to teach and what I have taught, but I think I gave that to you before. It'll come up. Anyway, we go all the way back to Genesis 11. We have the Tower of Babel. That was not a tower building up as tall and as high as it can be like Jack and the Beanstalk. That was a tower astrological. They were already worshiping the heavens, worshiping the constellations rather than worshiping the God who created them. God came down that those towers they were building was for the gods to be able to come down and commune with human form. Well, God did come down, but not because they built the tower, but he came down and said that he confused their language to cause them to go out as they were supposed to do and not be in worship. But we do see in archaeological findings, um, and we see through time in scripture, we talked about how the golden calf that they worshipped right after they came out of Egypt was after Taurus, the sign of the bull, the calf being a young bull, that it again was that worship of uh, the zodiac. Sadly, uh, Genesis 10 tells us a lot about um, how it started too with Nimrod who died, his wife gives birth to a son called some Tammuz, says it's Nimrod um, reborn, worship Nimrod, worship the sun, we have the worship of the god and the god son, we see the faults right there. We find out as we go through our original testament scriptures that our children of Israel fell into idolatry. They suffer the consequences of going into captivity for it, but before they got to that point when God is warning them and, and calling them away from it, that they even painted the zodiac um, creatures and hung them on the walls or painted them on the walls of the temple. Went into the temple where they're to be worshiping the one true and living God and they're worshiping his creation instead. They worship the queen of heaven. We'll see more of this. That's the sad side. The positive side is we see Daniel. Daniel, Daniel taken into captivity in Babylon goes in as a child of the one true and living God, a relationship with God. He had wisdom from God. We see the, how his life exemplified wisdom from the very first days of his time in Babylon. And we see that he was put among the wise men and he taught them. That's why we believe, because it's that area, that the wise men came to see Yeshua Jesus shortly after his birth. How did they know? They said they saw his star in the east. We're going to talk more about that. We won't probably get to a whole lot of that today, but it's coming very soon. We're going to see that the fingerprint that started that teaching for them goes back to Daniel. Daniel shared with them what God had revealed to Abraham, to his forefathers, to, to the others. Daniel knew it also was able to teach the wise men, and there were those who continued on who left the astrological ways for the truth. And again, that's where we'll be studying. We see biblical evidence all through scripture that God uses his creation to teach about himself. That's why no one is without excuse. Even if they're born in the jungles on the other side of the world where you're saying, you know, they haven't had a chance to know about Yeshua Jesus, so how can they be held responsible? Are they not in God's creation? Yes, they are. They live in this earth. They're in God's creation. They can look around and see and be directed to the God of creation. And if they come to any light wanting more truth, God reveals that to them one way or another, whether it be through missionaries who do go, whether it takes an angelic form, however God needs to do it, he stops at nothing short. He left heaven, came down to earth, born into human flesh, can you imagine God deciding to confine himself in human flesh to do nothing but grow up to die? 
and of course resurrect that we might have this life. If he did all that, there's nothing more you could say that could be done that's greater than that. So again, he's not going to leave anyone out. So everyone has the signs. Creation is the signs. The Hebrew word sign literally means to come. It's looking for someone or something to come. As we look at these signs, we're going to see they were showing someone who was to come. And we know that literally is Messiah Yeshua Jesus. Um, we see, okay, oh, let me remind you that we saw that God named the stars. He let Adam name the animals, but he named the stars. The stars were his finger work. He hung out the stars just by his fingers, and he named them and called them by names. When we look at the names that we still have today, and the story they tell us, the narration that they tell us, we see why God had to name the stars so that we are given the truth of what it was for. God had a purpose in that name. When he gives us a new name, there's a reason for that also with us. That'll be exciting to find out when we're home one day. We see all the way back in Yeov, in the book of Job, which goes all the way back to at least Abraham's day, if not a little prior, we see that they were aware of the constellations. Job named Arcturus, we call it the Great Bear, Orion, the Pleiades. We see the word Masroth used in scripture, and again, Masroth is the zodiac, the pathway. Um, and Job knew, he said that in his flesh, he would see his Redeemer alive. How did he know that? Obviously, God had to have revealed it to him through the stars rather than through the written word. I believe that God has allowed a lot to be lost today because we have the written word. We're not dependent on the stars today. We don't even get to see the majority of stars today, and we don't have the ability to have the, the teaching brought down in its pure form. Like, they did back then, even for the shepherds to be seen when Yeshua was born. We'll talk about that when that time comes also. But I believe that God allowed it to, to wane when there was the written word. But before the written word, he saw to it they had good knowledge so that they could know the truth. God had redemption planned before Adam and Eve were ever placed into the Garden of Eden. And we'll even see and talk a bit about that at times also. Um, we saw that historically with, there was evidence of the astronomy, those astronomical names. In scripture, yes, I've already shown you. I just gave you Job, but when we went through it, I gave you more. But outside of scripture also, Josephus, a respected uh, Jewish historian who wrote for the Roman world, Origen, one of the early... Um, influences with the early fathers of Christianity. We saw the Romans, the Greeks, the Egyptians, the Chaldeans all had the zodiac. Now they did not all have it where they're following it pure because Satan right away brought in his faults. Even the names of the days of the week we saw was, was worshiping gods and so forth. Um, our Jewish people have been kept from that. It's interesting that they still call the days of the week day one, day two, day three, rather than these false gods' names. Um, don't let that trouble you that you call a day like today Wednesday. We are not worshiping the God that was represented by that because we do know better. Um, I think the last thing to bring out before we start into our in-depth for today in new material is Numbers 24-17. And in fact, I'm going to read that for you because I think that's very important to lay down that in our foundation. Numbers 24, Ben Midbar in our Hebrew, verse 17, speaking about the Lord who will, Yeshua Jesus who would come. We read, I see him, but not now. I look at him, but not near. Okay, I'm looking, I'm looking <laughs> toward Yeshua Jesus. He's not coming tomorrow. When this was written, this is back in Moshe's day, he's not, or, or yeah, J Jacob's day, sorry. Anyway, back in our ancient history, um, but he saw, he's looking and he's seeing. What does he see? A star shall appear from Jacob. Now that we've got our eyes open, the fact that the stars are significant signs of something, and we know the Hebrew is telling us is a picture of someone to come, we understand that what he could really be saying is, I see the star that tells me that Yeshua Jesus is coming, and he's going to come out of Jacob's line. 
we'll see how we get that specific as we go on through our study. A scepter shall rise from Israel. We know the scepter belongs to the tribe of Judah. Um, okay. I'm going to disappear. I, I need the help. Somebody, oh, that's okay. I, I should you just can't. get up. No, it's too hard Thank to get you. You're welcome. Okay, I'm right back. And someone was struggling to get a pen that fell. So anyway, um, okay, so the scepter would, would rise from Israel. It tells us that this, in relation to the star in, Jude, in Jacob, it has to do with the tribe of Judah. We know, because we, we get to look back, we know that Yeshua Jesus came from Judah, who came from Jacob, who came from um, David. Isaac and David. Abraham. I, I'm, I skipped past David. David was a little <laughs> earlier. But it's still that line. That's all being told to us in this verse. And when we get to that star that the wise men in the east saw that they called his star we're going to remember this verse and we're going to see how this all ties together so i'm laying out just a round picture but to give you a foundation to build on okay so that's, uh, numbers 24 and what verse? verse 17 verse 17 and even our rabbis see, see that as a prophetic verse which is interesting so lastly, before we start, I did say last week, I'll just say it again today, that we see the division of the zodiac, as we're studying, it, let's call it the scroll of heaven, okay? We know that the scriptures were written in scrolls, the scrolls opened up and read, and it's wound up, and we know that Revelation tells us that this heavens and earth will be rolled up like a scroll. The stars have fallen before that. There's a lot of symbolism, but we know that then there's a new heavens and a new earth. So we'll call it the scroll of heaven, and we're going to divide it into three books. Book one will talk to us about the Redeemer in his first coming. Book two will talk to us about the redeemed. And book three will talk to us about the Redeemer in his second coming. Each book will have a, a peculiar aspect of the coming one. And I say that because, remember, we're looking to the, the, the one who is coming. So, as we start off today, we were to the point that we are seeing that this zodiac, this ellipt elliptical path that the sun is going to go through the constellations, is, in essence, I'm calling it a circle because it doesn't have a beginning and an end, but it's not a round circle. It's more oval, you know, but it, it, it's... Elliptical. It's elliptical. Yeah, okay? So, if it has no beginning and no end, how do we know where to start? Well, the logical point of where to start would be to start with the virgin who gives birth to the one who is the, the Redeemer. This is the start of his first coming. Virgo is the name given that talks to us about the virgin. That's why you will hear me use the 12 names that Satan uses. He can't create something brand new. He has to take what's gauze and, and counterfeit it, the same way we talked about that dollar bill. If you are going to learn how to call out counterfeit money, you study the real, and then you can pick out that, that false. Well, Satan has warped. We need to study the real, and then we can call out what's false. So when you go into Virgo and you say, oh, I'm under that sign and that means I have these strengths and these weaknesses, and you start looking for the stars to be relating to it, and that tells you when you should or shouldn't do something, you can know that you are way off track. You are now into astrology, into the horoscope, and you are on that path to destruction that I preach long and hard, and I use the word preach because I'm on my sandbox, <laughs> to stay away from I encourage you, don't even open up and read a horoscope, because why do you want to read something that comes from Satan? And that's where it comes from. Does he have foreknowledge? Well, he can read as much as we can. He can know what we know, because scriptures tell us what's coming. But does he know specifically what's going to happen in your life the way that God, your Father in heaven knows? Of course not. But he certainly can try to influence you and control your mind. Don't open your mind to him. But we're going to look at what God meant when he showed Avraham this constellation called Virgo. And by the way, the pictures that are drawn, like when we talk about the great bear, 
the, 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 the Big Dipper's been part of that. When we talk about these different shapes, <coughs> the shapes are not given to us in Scripture where we, we say, this is it. It's a way that they took those stars that God talked to them about, and it, they put it into a picture to give us a handle to hold on to it and to be able to explain it a little better. So when Father was passing down the Son, he'd call it the Great Bear, and he'd draw a line like a bear. But if someone else drew it like a deer or an elk or, you know, whatever, you know, it, that doesn't matter. It's the actual stars themselves and what their names are, what they're teaching that we're going to be looking at. Um, so when, when I use those names, just realize that's where it stops. Astrology takes and warps. We stop with the pure name. So Virgo will be our natural place to start, the virgin birth. And if we start there and we're on the right track, then when we look at the end, and, and Roger, don't put the chart up yet, but we have a chart, and if you don't have it, I'm trying to get it to everybody, let me know, and we'll work that out. But you're, you're seeing, you know, the circle when you're looking at it. Some of you have it in small, some of you may not have it. We can pass this one around. I'll need to come back to me, though. Um, but what I just want you to see right now is, if we start with Virgo, number one, what's number 12? That happens to be Leo. Leo happens to be the lion. The lion speaks to us of the tribe of Judah, and it speaks to us of the Lord returning as reigning in all his majesty, rather than it being his first coming as suffering servant. So it fits perfectly to be the story of Yeshua, from his first coming to his second coming. We can see it. So it sounds like we're on the right track. Someone asked in time, past time, What's the riddle of the Sphinx? Why is the Sphinx made the way it is? Well, if you know that the Sphinx has the head of a woman and the body of a lion, and you know that they were into astrology, in essence, it's believed that that was showing the people even studying astrology where to start. That Virgo was considered the start and Leo was considered the finish. And that's why they made the Sphinx was to honor all the astrological world. Well, again, we're not honoring the world. We're not looking at that, but we do see that they had that part. Satan used that part. Let's start at the very beginning. A very good place to start, okay? And we will see how Yeshua fulfills prophecy in relation to this also. By the way, if I did not give the scriptures last week, but I think I did, the heavens departing as a scroll can be found in Revelation uh, chapter 6, verses 14 to 17. And you also can read about this in Yeshia, Isaiah 34, verses 4 and 8. But I think we looked them up last week. And Revelation 21, 1, of course, gives us the new heavens and the new earth. So just to make sure those are on record, there is that. And now we will look at that first sign, the sign called Virgo. And I will ask Roger to put it up on the screen. And, uh, you know, it's an easy one for us to see because it's the shape of a woman, the way that they drew it to help us understand. Now, this is the first book. Oh, okay, and when he does this, I forgot to get the pointer. Put your marker, Roger, that you're using right now. Right. Put that on Virgo when you get back to the map. He has to do a split screen share, so it'll come in a minute for those of you in, in the Zoom world. And even in my living room, you'll be able to see that one also. There we go. So on your right, a little lower than, oh no, on my right. Yeah, just barely come in. Right there, right there. That's there right you go. Right. There is the woman. Oh, notice, okay. notice her right now because we won't always have it up there. She's got something in both hands. One's up and one's down. Okay, mm -hmm. I'll explain what that is. But in her right That's hand so is a branch, and some ears of corn or wheat are in her left hand. So just so you can see it, but I'll come back and explain that in just wow. just a couple minutes. Okay. That's our first. Um, constellation that we're going to look at today. So um, when you want, Roger, you can take it back off. I'll leave that judgment up to you. As I mentioned, we're studying three books. We're, we're going to divide the 12 constellations. <coughs> Bless you. Obviously, there's four constellations in each book. And I want to, without confusing you, tell you under Virgo, under each major name, each of those main 12, we will see three smaller constellations. So you're going to have a total of four in each one. So by the time we're done, 
we have 48 constellations that we've looked at, 12 major and 36 minor because the, the minor, three each under each sign, but they're all used to tell us the story. That's why we call it a book. A book has different chapters in it. It has the main and then it has the chapters, okay? So this is what we're looking at. The first book, to remind you again that the first book speaks about the Redeemer, his first coming, okay? And in his first coming, we're going to see the sufferings of the Messiah. Because we know in his first coming, bless you, in his first coming, he did come as suffering servant. He did come, suffer, and die that we might live again. Praise God. He resurrected into newness of life, an abundance, abundant life that he gives to us also. Um, Pam, can you get that from Loretta? She's trying to... Get the end. And give it to Anne. And she has seen it on the screen now too, so it may have helped, but I'll take it when you're done with it. So it all fits that this is what we should see then is something that tells us about the sufferings of Messiah. This isn't the time we're going to see the lion, and we're going to see regality, and we're going to see rulership. This is the time of the suffering servant. The sign of Virgo is the prophecy of the promised seed of the woman. Does that take us right back to where we were in Scripture when we started? That Abraham was promised a seed. And who did we say that seed was? Who's the singular seed? Isaac. Okay, that was his immediate. But when, and God was telling me to have a whole family, but yes. Yes. Let me show you because I want to make sure you're really grasping hold. If I seem to be beleaguering a point in the beginning, we will move faster at other times, but we've got to have a solid foundation. If you go to school and you don't learn your alphabet and plus and minus in the beginning, God with us. Emmanuel L. God with us. Actually, with us, God <laughs> from the Hebrew. But now we know this one is coming from God because it's God with us. And we know that when Yeshua Jesus was born, yes, he's called Jesus, Yahushua, which means God saves. He's also called Emmanuel in other places in Scripture because it is God with us. And we know, when did God choose to come into the human race? When he slipped into time, he slipped into our space, he put on a face, and we call him Yeshua Jesus. That's, that's just a, his Hebrew and his English name, but he was Emmanuel, God with us. So, the prophecy of the promised seed of the woman means a miraculous birth. Now, we saw that somewhere long before Isaiah. Isaiah is 700 years before it happens anyway, and I love that. You want to prophesy right now and tell me something that's going to happen 700 years from now and hit the target on the head? <laughs> Good luck. I mean, look at what, how the, our world has changed in the last 100 years. How would someone 700 years ago be able to nail something now if it were not God, prophetically speaking? Let me take you further back. Let me take you all the way back to the very first prophecy. I'm going to take you back to Bereshit, the very beginning, Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. And we're going to see that Isaiah was building on Genesis. Genesis 3.15. And we're going to look at this picture also again. I don't think we'll get there today, but we'll look at this in the stars in the sky. It's fascinating. It blows me away how much we're going to see. But right now what we read in verse 15, God speaking, he said, I will make enemies of you and the woman. That's uh, Satan. Uh, against human, hum, the human family, okay? And of your offspring and her descendant. Again, they translated it descendant. Again, it's the word we get seed from. So God's saying there's going to be a, an enemy. There's going to be war between her seed and, in essence, his seed. Because we know Yeshua Jesus is called his seed, okay? So there's going to be... A tug, uh, it's more than tug of war. There's going to be an all-out war, an all-out fight between the offspring that comes out of Eve coming down in the human line that we know is inseminated by God, so it's holy. It's our Messiah. And we're going to see that it's against Satan, the enemy 
of the woman, the enemy of God, the one who came and got Adam and Eve to sin. Okay, how do we see that battle? It says he, meaning the, um, the descendant that comes through the woman, he will bruise you. He's speaking specifically to Satan. He will bruise you on the head. You will bruise him on his heel. Okay, I'm going to go backwards. I'm going to start with the last phrase. How did Satan bruise Yeshua, Jesus, the seed of the woman, on the heel? Well, Baby the heel the is son. where you touch the earth, okay? In his human form, Satan brought about, only because God planned it and God was the one who said this is how it's to go, but he brought about the human death of Jesus, the crucifixion. Okay, that bruised Messiah's heel, but it didn't kill him. His human body died, who he was lived, and he was resurrected three days later before the human body would even start to decay. Because that's what God had promised in Psalm 110, that his Holy One would not see corruption. That means that body wouldn't start decaying. And that's why the Lord had to be raised on the third day, not on the fifth day. Because the fourth day is when decay sets in. So here's God in his exact timing again. So, yes, Satan, you're going to be able to bruise his heel. And I fully believe that when Satan saw the crucifixion, he thought he had won. He thought he had victory. He was having a heyday. <laughs> but... And, and it's not right to say it, but he who, well, he who laughs last. <laughs> we know that, that this was all, he, Satan, all he did was play into the hand of God. That's all he did. Yeshua willingly gave up his life. He laid it down for those he left. We know that. It wasn't that Satan got the upper hand. But let's go back to that phrase before now that says, He shall bruise you on the head. Okay, so John, you managed to bruise Messiah on his heel, his human earthly part that touched the earth. But it's saying that he, Messiah, he, Yeshua, Jesus, will bruise you on the head. Now, the word bruise both times gives appearance of the word crush in our English. He crushed his heel, but you can live with a crushed heel. And we know Messiah continued to live. Messiah always lived. Satan never didn't win the victory for a moment. Not for a day, not for an hour, nothing. But when he crushes the head of Satan, if somebody crushes the head, it's dead. Okay? If your head's crushed, you cease to live. When they don't know if that person is alive or not, and they put on the, the, the things to detect brain waves, if they don't find brain waves showing activity, they declare the person dead. So this is saying you're going to just touch him in his humanness, which is conquered, but he is going to crush your head. You're going down and defeat Satan. You will be under his foot crushed. He's going to crush your head, your death. And I can't wait for that day to be seen in its totality when he's cast into the lake of fire forever and ever and ever. But the same way Abraham looked and saw Yeshua Jesus' day, we look and see Satan's ending, and we know he's defeated. It's over. Amen to that. God said it. I believe it. Amen. That settles it. It's over. I don't care what Satan tries to do between now and that day, he will never thwart the plan of God. So it's as good as done. I'll take it to the bank today. I'll cash it out and I'll get the reward, okay? So, right back from the very first prophecy, in the very beginning, we see the prophecy of the seed of the woman, the virgin born, so that it did not have um, the sin nature that comes through the, the line of the male, not putting males down. We all sin. We're all born with this in nature, but it's passed down through that male line. We see that in Scripture so that he would be 100% sinless, so that he would be able to die for us, resurrect for us, all of this prophesied. This is the seed of the woman who would, would be our Redeemer. So right away we already have a picture of the Redeemer in his first coming, his suffering, his death, 
his resurrection, all this being seen already in the Virgin, in the Virgo, in the sign, but I'll give you a little bit more. If we could see fully, we would see that it takes 110 stars to make up Virgo. Now, we don't have all those in sight today, nor do we have 110 names for us to study. So I'm not going to keep you here until the year 2025 studying this. <laughs> but it is the second largest constellation. The brightest star in it, and this is what blows my mind, I limit God. God forgive me. I don't mean to, but in my finite mind, I limit Him. The brightest star in Virgo, in this constellation, the brightest one, is twice as large as our sun, and it's 2,300 times brighter. So it's the biggest wow. star? In Virgo, not in all of God's stardom, but in Virgo, it's the largest star. Oh. Okay? I'm just telling you that to get your minds to explode, to take off the lid. Open up wide, because if you're like me, you don't realize how enormous heaven is. How enormous the stars are to tell the story, okay? We've been told we have a north star that's brightest than ever. And I keep looking for that when it, the stars are out, but I don't really see it. Because there's quite a few out there, but there's... The North yes. Star is supposed to be really bright. We will talk about the North Star. We'll talk about what it means, but you don't always get to see it. It's not always in your hemisphere to see, although the, the, the North Star, I think, is the fixed star. But still, because we're turning. So there, there's so much. It, honestly, I have to hold on. I, I'm, I'm not a dummy, but I'm not a rocket scientist either. And sometimes we have to really hold on in this study to fully understand. But in the, to see this Virgo and this largest star is in the northern hemisphere in the spring and summer months. So if you live in the northern hemisphere, that's the sky you're seeing. That's the time of year you would see it. Where if you were in the southern hemisphere, you would see it in the, the fall and the winter months. And I say that to remind you. The stars are moving. There is a fixed star. We'll talk about it later. But the stars are moving. Remember when the shepherds would be watching their flocks by night and they are passing down to their children the genealogies and whatever else they're wanting to teach their children. They also would be able to look up and see over, it take a whole year to see all these 12 constellations go by. So they're not ripping by. One's there for a month. And they would be able to talk about that and teach them about that, teach them the names of the stars in that constellation, what it's a picture of. And then the next month they'd be talking about another. So we can see, you know, how God was revealing it again before there was written word. Let's look a little closer. As I mentioned, you can look at your charts if you want. It doesn't matter whether Roger puts it up or not because it's not that clear. And it's our drawings that, that, that bring this. But we know that the woman has a branch in her right hand and some ears of corn or wheat in her left hand. Now, when you see the ears of corn, when you see wheat, you're thinking of the, the fruit of the field. And we know that that makes us think about first fruits, the first that comes out. Remember, we've just come through Passover time and we're counting the omer, which is the grain ripening. And we are today on, tonight at sundown is day 33. We're going to count all the way to 50. But the first fruits were brought into the temple the day after Passover, the very beginning of what was ripening in the field. Yet it's going to be 50 more days before the field is ripe, and it will be harvested, and the first fruits will be brought in, and we'll be celebrating Shavuot, the, the holy day of first fruits. But what we're seeing here by seeing that, that wheat or that corn, it's making us think of first fruits. Why would Virgo be pointing our direction to first fruits? Well, again, what's scripture going to teach us? Let's look at 1 Corinthians 15, where it talks about first fruits and see what that has to mean. 1 Corinthians 15, we'll start with verse 20 and we'll read through verse 23. But the fact is, Christ, the anointed one, Messiah, that's Christ is out of the Greek, Messiah is out of the Hebrew, the one we call Jesus, has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. Remember, he was the first to rise into that position of equality with God. We know that even when he died on the cross and the graves were opened, where some literally came out of the graves 
as a witness to what had been done, they didn't come out of those graves till after three days, till after Yeshua Jesus rose first. When you look at that in Matthew, I want to say it's all in 27, it's toward the end of Matthew, I think it's all in 27, you will see that the graves were open, but they didn't come out until Yeshua Jesus raised first because he was the first fruits. If Yeshua Jesus did not raise into resurrection life, we would not raise into resurrection life. That's what we're being told. The, the first fruits of those who have died, they are going to rise again. They will come into this eternal life in the heaven with the Lord forever. But here it's telling us, verse 21, For since by a man death came, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. See, it took a human to, to buy us back. That's what redeem means, is to pay the purchase price. To redeem it, you know, if you've lost something and you had to, like, give it up to a thrift store, a, a pawn shop, and you buy it back, you redeem it, is what they're saying. You're buying it back, you're paying the price. Well, the human price of our sin that we're all guilty of is death. So we need to pay a price to get life back. We can't. We've got nothing to pay that price. That price is called sinless blood. We don't have sinless blood, not a one of us. But this one, man came, I'm sorry, death came by a man, it came through Adam. When Adam and Eve ate the fruit, it said, in dying you shall surely die. It's showing us that spiritually they died immediately, physically the process started. So when you got aches and pains and you feel like you're getting old today, you've got Adam and Eve to blame for it. <laughs> okay. God didn't intend for humans to wear out. <laughs> That's the consequence of sin. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. So if death came into the human race by a man, then it's telling us by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. Now, what man? There's only one who could qualify because all of us are paying for our own sins. That's why we die. No one manages to live sinless, to live perfect an entire life. Never, not one mistake, not one wrong word, not one shortcoming. Up on the holy level of God, none of us get there. So we don't have blood that can say, hey, it cleanses me from that. I get eternal life. I get to live with God forever. But Yeshua did. Because he was fully divine, at the same time as being fully human, he lived perfect, he lived sinless, he made it all the way to his death on the cross, not dying for himself, saying, I'll die in your place so that I am buying you back. I'm redeeming you. We'll put my blood where yours should go, and then you will also have the, the newness of life, the resurrection of life, so that verse 22, and then I'll get your question, says, for as in Adam all die. In the human race we all die, but so also in Christ, in the anointed one, in Messiah, we will all be made alive. This is how we get to live forever, because we come through his shed blood. But it took being the first fruits, it took him putting his blood there, and saying, this is for all who follow me, all who will put their faith in me. It covers, well, actually washes away their sin. Lorette. Uh, when, the, when you said the people that when Christ, uh, after he died, he, he arose, those people in the graves didn't come out, like it says in the Bible, they, they walked Jerusalem, the streets. Not they until, didn't do that until after Christ came out of the grave himself. Let me prove it to you. But yes, that's exactly what I'm saying. Let's go real quick to Matthew 27. Um, and I'll have to hunt for the verse, but I know it's toward the end. Uh, okay. 53. 53, thank you. And thank you. I'm coming down to that real quick. Yes, yes, okay. Yeah, all right. Let's go for 52, 51, 50. Okay, 50, we have Yeshua, Jesus cries out and gives up his spirit. That was the end. That's when we know he died on the cross. He had just said, it is finished. Tetelestai, it is done, it is completed. 
and actually it talks about paid in full fits with our purchase price right now perfect then at that time verse 51 tells us that the veil in the temple was torn from the top to the bottom that veil that they're talking about opened the way into the holy of holies because it was showing us that now there was a way to come into the presence of god through the cross through the shed blood of yeshua jesus so we know what time this has happened the earth shook the rocks are split and that's when the tombs were open verse 52 also the tombs were open and many bodies of the saints notice it's not all of them but many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep nice way to say who had died were raised okay so we know that they're showing what the same thing that we say about yeshua jesus that he raised from the dead but notice verse 53, and that's the key for your answer, um, and was right on. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they entered the holy city, they entered Jerusalem, and appeared to many. They went and they knocked on the doors of their families and their friends and said, I'm proof. The fact that I am alive, the fact that you are seeing me, that I have been raised from the dead, is living proof that Yeshua Jesus raised from the dead. And so it was just a way of sharing that testimony with others who could tangibly see, who, who knew, who said, hey, my hands wrapped you in those, um, what they bury them, shrouds, in the, in the you swaddling. know, whatever they bury them. Swaddling clothes. <laughs> swaddling clothes is for babies, not for death. <laughs> but, you know, they were That's wrapped. Right. I, I, I helped wrap you. I put the spices on your body. I put you in that tomb. And you're standing here before me, alive? You know, that was resurrection proof that something had changed. There was now this newness of life that had been purchased for us by Yeshua Jesus. He too was seen. There's more proof of his resurrection than there is that George Washington walked on this earth. And yet nobody argues with me when I say George Washington was a real man who lived on this earth and was our first president. And yet people will argue with me and say, Jesus is dead. Well, do you know he was seen by several women he was seen by miriam first i love the story then he was seen by several women he was seen by the, the apostles that came to the tomb he was seen by the 12 in the upper room he was seen by 500 at one time okay can you pull the wool over 500 people no. <laughs> not easily okay much evidence he walked the road of emmaus with those who were blinded to who he was and the moment that they saw and realized he was gone. Where'd he go? <laughs> I love it. So much proof. But if they did not come out of the graves. They did not show that resurrection life until he, being first fruits, showed it first. Mm -hmm. And this is what we're seeing in the, the, vir in the virgin's um, hands is a picture of him being first fruits. Okay, now. Um, and by the way, in all the traditions, maybe I shouldn't use the word all, but in, in, if not all, in the majority of traditions, in the mythologies, even when they give Virgo a different name, they all recognize the woman as a virgin. That's, that's interesting to note because of the controversy that they want to give us today over it. But, uh, and also, it is interesting, it is a sub, you know, a second layer for us. <clears throat> But remember the church, the called out assembly, we are considered a chaste virgin and our bridegroom is Christ, that we will be, yeah. that we are in essence married to him. So the virgin also can be a picture of that for us too, that, that we are the bride of Christ. Okay, the Hebrew name, by the way, when I told you there's two words, the one for virgin is Betula, if that ever helps you for any reason. But now let's notice, okay, we see that the corn and wheat showing us first fruits, what about the branch? What is the branch telling us? Again, because these names were given to these stars, we know that there's a reason for it. Well, let's see what the branch means. Let's... Um, well, she has a branch in her hand? A branch corn. in one hand, oh, and guess. in the other she has corn wheat. or wheat. Corn or wheat. wheat. Or wheat, yeah. We can't tell. You could call it either the same way, like I said. <laughs> one may say it's the shape of a bear, and another one may say it's the shape of a deer. You know, we're not, we're not caught up on what those, you can connect the dots the way you want. And if your mind sees it a little differently, that's okay. What we're going to look at is what those names in that picture are standing for. It looks like a wheat because if you look at the corn, the way it is, yeah, it's more, more like it's Okay, there's my farmers. 
They're telling me it looks more like wheat, and I'll take their word for it. Okay, at least in our picture, it looks more like wheat. Okay, but either one is first fruits, is, is that first coming. So what does the branch mean? The branch, let's look at what do we see about the branch in Scripture. How about our prophet Isaiah? Who is the branch? Good question. It's going to be a John. Branch. No, we're going to look. A branch coming out of. Up. A branch coming out of. Um, Shemak. Judah's tribe. Oh, scepter. Scepter comes out of, which is not. It's related. Oh, it's related, <laughs> but it's not exactly. So, but good thought, good thought, because it is, it is. I like that. I'm playing with what that in my mind right now. Isaiah 11 is what we're going to look at, and I love Rowena. She gets an A plus. She said, Samak. That's the name for the branch. Why am I all excited over that? Because she's been a part of the Samach and Christian Alliance family ministry that we are a part of. And that name means the branch. And because she brought it up, I will tell you, when Pastor Gill and I were trying to name our new little baby when we were giving birth, to um, what, what today we call Emmanuel Israel, our, where we have our services. But when we were coming up with the, the, like the umbrella name, Emmanuel Israel is a part of this. We wanted a name that would reflect who we were. And we had both tried a couple different names. Nothing was quite right. And all of a sudden, literally at the same moment in time, I came out in Hebrew. He came out in English. <laughs> He said, what about the branch? And I said, what about Samach? And we looked at each other when I heard him say that. I looked at him and I said, that's what Samach means. Boom. We both knew it. We, it was over in an instant. We Shabbat both means knew Samach means the branch. And that's when we say Samach Global Ministries, we are the branch reaching the world with the truth of who Messiah is. Because he is the branch that will fill the face of the earth. But that's how we got our name. We, got it. we used a different scripture, which we'll go to in, in a moment, but let me take you to the beginning of it. Isaiah, Yeshia 11, 1 says, A shoot will spring from the stem of uh, Yeshu, Jesse in our English, and a branch from his roots will bear fruit. Okay, we've got tree talk going on here, don't we? So we've got a branch, we've got a shoot, we've got a stem. Something's going to come up out of Jesse because the stem is original. The shoot springs out of the stem. The shoot turns into the branch. The branch from his roots is going to bear fruit. The fruit is the spirit of the Lord resting on him, which goes on verses 2 and 3. But we'll stop with the branch because that's our part that we're talking about. Who is this a picture of? Well, by the time you get to the, to the end of verse 3, we know it's speaking about the Lord. We know there's, there's no doubt about it at all, and the Spirit of the Lord would be on him. Remember, the, the Ruach HaKodesh would inseminate Miriam. The Spirit of the Lord was always all over Yeshua. He grew in the knowledge and grace of God in his humanness, but he was teaching in the temple as a child because he was the author of the scriptures he was teaching. And he had the Spirit of God on him, in him, a part of him, the wisdom, the understanding, the counsel, the strength, all that you read as you go on in 11, um, chapter 11, verses 2 and 3. Back up to chapter 4 in Isaiah. Chapter 4, verse 2. And we'll see in Isaiah 4 and verse 2. On that day, the branch of the Lord will be beautiful and glorious, and the fruit of the earth will be the pride and the beauty of the survivors of Israel. He's promising Israel the fruitful um, future that she will have. We'll see that in his second coming when he rules and reigns through the nation of Israel here on this earth. But notice the fruit. Remember, he's first fruits. We talk spiritually, but we'll also see Israel as the, the first fruits of the nations. But we take it to that higher level. On that day, the branch of the <coughs> Lord will be glorious and beautiful. Who's the one that's going to bring Israel into this position and sit as her head? Yeshua, Jesus, our Messiah. So the branch in chapter 4 and verse 2 is speaking of the Lord. So when we see the branch in her hand, it's talking to us about Messiah. It's talking to us that Messiah is going to come. We're going to see him in reality in relation to our world. Let's go to another prophet. Remember, we like two or three witnesses, don't we? So let's go to Jeremiah, Jeremiah. Easy for you, it's the next book over. Go to Jeremiah chapter 23. Verses 5 and 6. Behold, 
Did you all wake up out there? Do you remember <laughs> Revelation? When God oh, says, behold, yeah. wake up, pay attention, there's something important here. Not that every word isn't important, but it is that jolt to awaken us. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David, David. I'll raise up a righteous branch. He will reign as king and act wisely, do justice and righteousness in the land. In his days, Judah, Judah will be saved. Israel will live securely. And this is his name by which he, may, he will be called. So we don't have to question who it is. The, the Lord, Lord our, righteousness. our righteousness. What did Abraham see? And it was accounted for righteousness the day of the Lord. And the righteousness of the Lord that was applied to Abraham so that he was in faith receiving that status that he was seen as righteous by God. How? Because he saw the righteous branch. We no doubt who this branch is. It's Messiah all over the place. I'll give you another prophet anyway, Zechariah. And I'll close my case with Zechariah, but I'll give you a couple verses in Zechariah. The first one, let's go to chapter 3. We'll look at Zechariah 3, verse 8. And then I'll give you our verses that we chose. Our, Zechariah is the Old Testament, huh? Zechariah is the Old Testament, yes. Yeah. Original Testament, yes. Um, almost the end. Zechariah and the Malachi in your English mm -hmm. Bibles. Okay, verse 8 says, now listen, Yahshua. Okay, this is not Joshua back in Moshe's day. This is Joshua the high priest. You and your friends who are sitting in front of you, indeed they are men who are a sign. Okay, they're looking for a sign again. For behold, <laughs> I'm going to bring in my servant, the branch. What chapter? Chapter 3, verse 8. Okay, remember what I told you in the first book? We're going to see his suffering servant side of him. Zechariah 3.8 is telling us that this branch is going to be God's servant. He's going to be lowly. A servant is not king. A servant is, is working for others. He's going to come to do the work of God. Now look at verse, I mean, sorry, chapter 6 of Zechariah, chapter 6. And verses 12 and 13, and this is where our name came from. Come on, tablet. There we go. Okay, chapter 6 of Zechariah, Zechariah, verse 12. Then say to him, the Lord of armies, Adonai Sabaoth, the Lord of hosts, the Lord of the heavenly hosts, says Behold. this. <laughs> Again, Behold. Behold, I think the Lord feels like this is an important message for us to get a hold of. There is a man. Now, if you have a good translation, it's capitalized the M for you. So right. it gives you a big hint that you're not talking about just mere man. But the rest of the verse will tell us. Behold, there is a man whose name is Smok, whose name is the branch. For he will branch out <laughs> from where he is. He will build the temple of the Lord. Yes, it's he who will build the temple of the Lord. He will bear the majesty. He will sit and rule on his throne, so he will be priest on his throne. And the council of peace will be between the two offices. He's going to be priest and king. Well, when you know that normally priests come from the Levitical line and the kings come from the line of Judah, this is a one who is greater than the normal man. He is going to be able to do both offices. He's going to be priest and he's going to be king. And even though it doesn't show us this in this verse, I'm going to throw it in. He's going to also be prophet. He is the only one. You will see others who are two offices. You will only find one in scripture who is all three. Prophet, priest, and king. That's who this branch is. That's none other than Yeshua Jesus. It makes it very clear that this is who the branch is. When we see the branch in our right hand, we are being given a picture of the one who is starting out as servant, but will return to role and reign as that one that brings this, the shalom on the earth. Okay? Now, the corn and the wheat also, I, let me take you back to that for a moment, because I didn't think at the time to tie it in. Remember the seed of the woman, okay? And corn and wheat cut our seed, they come, you know, props come from seeds. So we see that in Genesis 3.15 also when it's talking about the seed. We could see that pictured even from the corn and the wheat also because that comes out of seed. 
Now I'm going to take you to Yochanan, to John, which is, I think, where Loretta wanted me to go in the first place. Yeah. But now I'll take you to the New Covenant, to chapter 12 of the book of John, Yochanan, chapter 12, verse 20. We'll read 20 through 24. Now, there were some Greeks among those who were going up to worship at the feast. These people came to Philip, from, who was from Bethsaida. Bethsaida. Sorry, I can... Uh, okay, let me just stick with it. Um, of Galilee, I'm trying to read it in my English. And we're making a request of him saying, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip came and told Andrew, Andrew and Philip came and told Jesus. But Jesus answered them by saying, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat, here's our seed, here's our grain, here's our wheat, falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. So out of death will come life. Now, how many of you have a relative who died? You'll have what? A relative who's died. <laughs> is, is your entire family all still alive? Yeah, so far. None of mine's alive. Your grandparents? Your great grandparents? Oh, no. your... <laughs> all we all have alive. family that's died. Did any of us bring out life out of their death? No. No, we don't. We come out of life, not out of death. What we're seeing here is showing us that this one called the man is the God man who, because he had resurrection life and gives us that, he died to bring us life. Out of his death, we get resurrection life because he raised from the dead, we raise also. So we know this is, prophetically speaking, of Messiah, the Son of God, the seed of the woman, given in prophecy in Genesis, now in Isaiah, in Jeremiah, in Zechariah, and we see the fulfillment in Matthew and the other Gospels also. So, are we convinced that in this first sign we see the virgin who will bring forth seed? That seed is the branch, that seed is Samak, who will bring forth the harvest of salvation through his death. Is that not a beautiful picture? And that's the true meaning behind Virgo that we see from we're still on Virgo. We're still on Virgo. <laughs> now, it is interesting that that brightest star in Virgo is in the Hebrew and the Arabic languages. I'm talking ancient Hebrew. I'm talking ancient Arabic. I'm talking, I, I accept this from the scholars who know the languages. I do not, but I, I have no reason to doubt them because what we can see that they write, we can follow is truth. And they say that the original meaning back, way back, meant the branch. That brightest star was called the branch. So in Virgo, what's to stand out is the branch. And we just saw who the branch is. We saw that it's the fourfold, um, I shouldn't call it fourfold yet, it, it's Messiah. Let me tell you why I slipped and said fourfold, because we're going to look and we're going to see. And this, I did research this, I know for a fact, the word samak that we have for branch is in the four scriptures that I've given you. Isaiah 4, 2, in Jeremiah 23, 5 and 6, in Zechariah 3, 8, and in Zechariah 6, 12 and 13. Now, why do I pick out those four? Because I love this. You know how we get many layers with scripture. Let me show you the branch in those four scriptures correlate with Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Okay, so the branch of the Lord, Emmanuel, God with us, the, that character of the Messiah that we saw in Isaiah 7, 14, is fully manifested at his second coming as the branch that... that fills the face of the earth, he rules and reigns in peace on the earth, okay? Everything I've just described, we see in the gospel of Yochanan and John, we see the Son of God. See, our four gospels give us four different views of Messiah, of Yeshua, Jesus. John's big thrust shows him to be the Son of God, and that's a capital S, that is the prophesied Son, the promised Son, the messianic son 
So when I'm saying son of God, we're all sons of God by birth in Yeshua Jesus, but I'm talking he is the son of God, okay? We see all of that in, um, in, in the branch of the Lord in the way that we saw it in Isaiah and um, 7.14 and Isaiah 4.2. We see that pictured in the Gospel of John. Then when we looked at the branch of David, okay, the, John was the branch of the Lord, Emmanuel, God with us. When we see the branch of David, we read that in Isaiah, but it was, uh, well, let me just take you to Jeremiah, because it was easier to see. It called him the branch very clearly in Jeremiah 23. That's the Messiah, the seed of David according to his flesh, okay? The Messiah had to be able to prove that he came out of the loins of David, because he was promised through David would come the Messiah would come the one who would sit permanently on David's throne, that David's on it temporarily, but Messiah would come and sit on the throne, that the, his, his throne would be established forever. But when we look at Messiah according to the flesh, when we're looking at this view, we are looking at the Son of God according to the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew's whole thrust was to show him as king of Israel. He gives him that lineage that takes it back to the, he had the rightful heir to the throne in his human flesh. Um, that's why I tell you the beginning, the genealogy in Matthew 1 is perfect because it takes it all the way back to Abraham, but it brings it through Judah, who is the, the, the line to the throne, the royal line. But let me also show you Romans 1.3. Okay, Romans 1.3, I think will make it a little more clear to you what I'm trying to say. Romans 1, 3 says, concerning his son, okay, the son of God, concern, concerning his son, who was born of a descendant of David, seed of David, according to the flesh. So now we're talking about in his humanness, we are seeing in the book of Matthew, the king of Israel, the one who in his human flesh has a right to be called the king of Israel. And that's the, the, the branch that we saw in Jeremiah 23, verses 5 and 6, the righteous branch that, um, that was described there. Then we see the Lord as servant, okay? We're seeing him as, as Lord, Emmanuel, God with us. We're seeing him as the branch of David. Now we're seeing him as the Lord's servant. The branch that referred to him being the servant was what we read in Zechariah, Zechariah chapter 3 and verse 8. That's where it called, he, he would raise up the branch my servant, okay? What verse is that in Romans? In Romans it was 1-3, okay? Now, when we see the Lord as servant, we see him as that fulfillment with the word branch. We see the Messiah in his humiliation because the servant is a humble. We see it in his obedience to death. The servant carried out the wishes of the Father. We see that in Yeshia, Isaiah 52, verse um, 13 to 15, verse 13 in particular. I guess I'll read it quick because we're not going to get as far as I wanted today, but that's okay. What was that? Yeah. Isaiah 52, verses 13 to 15, and 13 will call him my servant. Behold, my servant will prosper. He'll be high and lifted up and greatly exalted. Just as many were appalled at you, my people, so his appearance was <coughs> marred beyond that of a man, his form beyond the sons of mankind. Okay, we know that was in his crucifixion. He was so horribly beaten that he was so disfigured he didn't even look human anymore. Verse 15, so he will sprinkle many nations. Kings will shut their mouths on account of him. For what they had not been told, they will see. What they hadn't heard, they'll understand. They're going to see he's king, not us, he is. And they're going to bow to him that we see him in that servant form. Follow through to Isaiah 53. I'm not going to read it all for you right now, but Isaiah 53 we know is a picture of the suffering servant of the Lord. We know it's the Lamb of God who sacrifices his life for, for Israel and for the world. In verse 13, I think it is, and I'm looking real quick. Uh, verse 11. Okay, I'm looking, I'm reading too fast. Where am I going to find it? Verse 11. I just missed it somehow. There it is. There it is. I have my hand on it. <laughs> Verse 11 of chapter 53 again refers to him as my servant. As a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it be satisfied by his knowledge. The righteous one, my servant, will justify many. 
He'll bring us justification, those who come to faith in him by his being the servant. This described in Isaiah 53. We read in Philippians chapter 2, and this you're probably familiar with. In Philippians chapter 2, we read how Messiah, this one that we're talking about, was humbled. He was a servant. Verse 5, have this attitude in you which was also in, and our English says Christ Jesus, that's in Messiah, Yeshua, who as, had, as he already existed in the form of God. Okay, Yeshua is God. He's co-equal with God. But he didn't take that as something to be grasped. That means he was willing to let go of his equality with God in the heavens. <clears throat> Why? He emptied himself, verse 7, by taking on the form of a bond servant. By coming into the human world as a servant. Being born in the likeness of man, he being found in the appearance of man, humbled himself, becoming obedient to the point of death, death on a cross. For this reason, also God highly exalted him, bestowed on him the name which is above every name. So we see him exalted back up. But I'm going to stop there. You can read more on your own. Because what I'm showing you is he, was, he came as a servant. He came humble. Zechariah 9.9 9 says he came lowly, riding on a donkey. He didn't come majestically on the horse with his entourage behind him and receiving worship. He came lowly on the donkey, even when they were worshiping him, throwing down the branches and saying that he's the one who saves. It still was done in a holy manner, and we see that in the Gospel of Mark. Mark emphasizes how Messiah Jesus was the servant. So now we have the Gospel of John seen with the branch as Emmanuel, God with us. We see the Gospel of Matthew seen with the branch of David, his human uh, connection, the flesh connection for Messiah. And in Mark, we see him as the servant, the servant who humbled himself to fulfill the will of the Father. That just leaves us Luke. Luke shows us the, the direction that Luke shows us of the Messiah, of Yeshua Jesus, is that he is the Son, capital S, of man. Okay, so he's Son, capital S, puts him as God, but he also took on human form he became man and we see that in the character of the branch when we read Zechariah 6 12 and 13 remember we talked about how he would be priest and he would be king and it takes that human to be you know he had to be of the flesh to save the flesh so we read that he was the last Adam in the first Adam death comes to us in the last Adam, life comes to us, and that's reflected in 1 Corinthians 15, 45 to 47. I think I might have read it earlier, but let's go ahead and look at it again. 1 Corinthians 15, 45 to 47. And we read, whoops, I went too far. Okay, we read in verse 45, so it's also written, the first man, Adam, became a living person. God breathed into Adam, formed him out of the, the elements of the earth, but he breathed and him, he became a living soul. Okay, that's what it's referring to. The first man became a living person. The last Adam was a life-giving spirit. However, the, spirit, the spiritual is not first, but the natural, then the spiritual. First came Adam, and Adam dies. Then comes spiritual life through the one who became the man for us. Verse 47, the first man is from the earth, earthy, the second man is from heaven. So to be that perfect man, he had to also be the son of God. He had to be fully son of God and fully human at the same time. And that's what Luke shows us, the son of man, which just happens to be a messianic title. So we see all four Gospels in different forms showing us the servant, the son of man, um, the king of Israel, what did I forget? And the Son of God. Okay, we see all four in, in the, the branch. So it's like the branch is showing us what Matthew tells us, the branch is showing us what Mark tells us, the branch is showing us what Luke tells us, and the branch is telling us what John tells us. And those four Gospels were to tell us who Yeshua Jesus is. Yeah. So when we see in Virgo, we see the virgin that would give birth to the seed, we see clearly who that seed is. This is the one described in all of these books. This is the one promised to us. And then in finishing off Virgo, um, I've just got a couple things to say about Virgo, and I'll be done so that I am closer to on time for us. 
in Virgo's skirt. So when you look at that, that chart again, in the skirt part, there's a bright star. In our um, original language, it's something like Sirma, S-Y-R-M-A, maybe, you know, when we bring it into our English. But what it means is the skirt of the Virgin's robe. Okay, it fits because it's in the robe of, of the Virgin. It's the skirt of the Virgin's robe. Well, what does Yeshua, what does Christ, what does his righteousness, how does that fit in with us? Well, let's look at Yeshua, Isaiah 61. Isaiah chapter 61, and we'll look at verse 10. Isaiah 61, 10 is speaking to, um, well, there's, Isaiah is speaking to Israel, but we'll see this personalized. I will rejoice greatly in the Lord. My soul will be joyful in my God, for he has clothed me with garments of salvation. He has wrapped me with a robe of righteousness. As a groom puts on a turban, as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. Did you catch that? He wrapped me with a robe of righteousness. We say that when we come into salvation, God puts his robe of righteousness on us. So even though originally we see that it's talking at a time to Israel, it's talking about when Israel would spiritually be saved, but we also see this robe that the virgin is, is wearing in the stars in the sky, that when it talks about the skirt of the virgin's robe, it's probably referring to the robe of righteousness because the virgin is telling us all about Christ who is going to robe us with the robe of salvation. Look at it with me at Ezekiel, Ezekiel chapter 8. Got to look at my notes in 16, verse 8. Ezekiel chapter 16 and verse 8. What was the branch again? What did it stand for? It, Messiah. Messiah. The Messiah. Christ. You I'm, know. I'm making new notes here. Okay. Yeah. Things. All four Gospels show so us it means Christ. Jesus. The yes. Branch means Jesus. The branch. The branches. You show Jesus. You see him in four different manifestations, four different angles in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and they all relate to one of the times when. It uses the word branch in the Hebrew. So we see him as a servant branch. We see him as king branch. We see him as Emmanuel with us, God with us. And we see him in his human uh, being of uh, the line to be um, the promised seed. I thought he would be the root and we're the branches, but it doesn't work like that. Well, the, we in the New Covenant, we are referred to him being the vine and we are the branches, and the branches can't live apart from the vine. But right now, what we're seeing in the Hebrew, the branch is Messiah himself. Mm -hmm. Now, the branch gives life to what comes off of him. He gives us oh, life, so you can okay. see it in that way. So God would be the root and Jesus is the branch? Could you look at it that way? Not really. Yeah, you kind of could, but God and Jesus are synonymous, so are, you know. They're both the same. Yeah. Yeah. But you could say that the root, I, uh, it falls down a little bit, but I get where you're headed and, and where you're headed, yes, because we all drink from the root. The root of our salvation is Yeshua Jesus, but he is God. So you could say the ball, the root ball is God, then the root that comes out is Yeshua Jesus branches out and that we are the fruit he even bears. You could you could use that analogy. You could follow it that way. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Some may have problems with that. If you do, that's okay. Um, let me finish up real quick so that um, um, so that we can get to questions. And, and I want to end, like I say, closer. E Ezekiel 16, verse 8. I passed by you and saw you, and behold, you were at the time for love. So I spread my garment over you. I covered your nakedness. I also swore an oath to you and entered into a covenant with you so that you became mine, declares the Lord God. Okay, how did they come into covenant with him? He put his garment over their nakedness. Their nakedness, when did Adam and Eve know they were naked? When they had sinned. The sin bears us naked before our God. He came and saw that and in his love put his garment over us, that garment of salvation. If you keep reading, uh, read through verse 16. I'm not going to take the time because I'm running out of time. But you have how he washed us, how he cleanses us, how he clothes us, um, even crowns us. And we know that he gives us crowns uh, that we just give back to him, but he gives them to us. You trusted in your beauty, verse 15, but it's showing you the contrast. You know, so as you keep reading, I think you can pick up that picture on your own. And Basically, 
And that's in what chapter? In Ezekiel what 8. Yeah. yeah. Basically what I want you to see is we are clothed in the robe of Christ's righteousness. We know that in Revelation 19 it tells us that, that the right, our righteous acts are a robe of righteousness. That no one's in heaven without the robe being on. But like my mom used to say, some may have long flowing robes because they've done much for the Lord once they were saved. Others may have a mini skirt, but you're all in heaven because you're clothed in his robe of righteousness. And that's what we're seeing a picture of. The virgin in, with the robe is reminding us that we are clothed in his robe of righteousness. Um, you can also look at Philippians 3. Verses 7 to 9, I've got a note here, and I honestly don't remember, so let me just take a quick sneak peek, and I'll tell you, but you can read those verses on your own. Oh, okay, that's where Paul made it very clear. There's nothing else that makes us righteous, not our works, not our background, not our upbringing, nothing. He says, whatever was gained to me, I consider it as loss of, because of Christ. I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. And then he says everything, everything he had gained, his education, his position, all that was rubbish. It was like trash that he, he just threw it all away to gain Messiah. It wasn't his background. It wasn't the works he'd done. It wasn't anything but, but Messiah himself and that it's his righteousness. Verse 9, that not having a righteousness of my own from the law, but through faith in Messiah, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith that takes us back to Abraham. Remember, it was counted to him for righteousness because he believed in, he put his faith in God and what God had revealed to him. And that's what we're seeing in this woman. The last point to bring out, and I'll repeat this next week for any who is too much at the end or who had to leave early. We're going to see that the woman is lying prostrate. And I'll explain a bit more about that, but on the elliptical, she's laying as if she has fallen and can't get up. Does that give you a new meaning to the commercial? <laughs> I've fallen and I can't get up. Well, she can't stand upright on her own. Fallen humanity cannot stand upright on her own. Maria is splitting over this. We, because of sin, we are all fallen and can't get up. We are all helpless. That includes Israel. That includes Mary, the mother of Yeshua Jesus. All are in that. We all need to be clothed in his righteousness. So even though we see the robe on Mary, on the virgin, I should say, in the sky, we're really seeing that her seed, Messiah, has robed her in righteousness. She did not become righteous and then she gave birth to the Messiah. No, she was human. God miraculously inseminated her, and yeah. she became righteous the same way as Abraham, and the same way as you and I today, putting her faith in the one that she gave birth to in human flesh, but was never born, always God from the beginning. Is that not an amazing picture? That's our first constellation, but we'll still look at the three little ones that come under her and see even more of this picture develop. But you're getting a sneak peek to what this whole study is going to be like for you. I just stand in awe. The further I get in it, the more excited I get. I'll tell you, I've had like a couple of falling. moments where I have... It's like they're all falling. They're all to laying on that elliptical. That they are, they are, but a woman would stand up right, where some of these others would, you know. So she's leaning, so that means she's falling. She's falling, yeah. Yeah, and she can't get up. So next time you see that commercial, remind yourself of Virgo, the picture of the Messiah that we see in the Virgin giving birth. And uh, hopefully that will bless you. Like I say, this day, it just gets better and better. There, I've had a couple of awesome moments where I have literally lost it, where I just explode with, ah, it just, <coughs> stay tuned. <laughs> That's all I can say. Just stay tuned. It just keeps getting better and better and better. And I'm seeing more and more and learning more and more, even though I've been through the study, you never get it all. You never do, not in our humanness. So, you know, and if you feel like you're just barely understanding, keep with me because it becomes a little more clear as we begin to see a little bit more. Kind of like when your teacher would introduce to you that new mathematical concept, and the first day you're going, and by the second day you go, okay, I get that part of it. Well, by the time you move down a little ways, you're going, oh, 
I get it, okay? Well, you will have, uh, you'll have aha moments, you'll have I get it moments, but I guarantee you, we're still just scratching the surface. We have no clue. It is higher than the heavens, deeper than the oceans, wider than the atmosphere. Our God is an awesome God. He is ineffable, and he wrote his story using stars. He wrote his story in blood. He wrote his story in the written word through 66 authors over 1,500 years from all walks of life, and they tell the same story. That's a miracle. That's our yeah. God. The beginning of the gospel of the stars. Dora. So did he create this as he's created the earth and the stars and stuff like that, and not as it's happening, but he did it first. Mm -hmm. He did to it show first. show us what was going to happen. Mm -hmm. Yep. He prophetically tells, remember I said he's prophet, priest, and king, and yes, he created all this before he put man in, on the earth. So when we read in Genesis 1, the creation of the sun, the moon, and the stars mm -hmm. is what we're talking about. And it excites me to think when, when people think they're going to be bored in, in heaven and in eternity, I have oh, to just well, laugh. It tells we're gonna, me. We're more bored here. Yes, we're more <laughs> bored here, exactly. It just tells me how little they know about the Bible, about the Word of God. But when you think to Revelation 21, you think this scroll's been all rolled up because it's all been fulfilled, it's all been done. What scroll does he unroll? What story does it tell? What's our future going to look like? We haven't a clue. If we're this excited over this, when we have the mind of Christ in us because we've been changed into immortality, we've, we're in his image, we've slipped out of this sinful state, and we have that ability to, to learn fully, to use our whole brain instead of 10%, what does he have planned for us? What's, what's he created? What are we going to see? What are we going to understand? Wow. <laughs> What did God do for who knows how long before he created us? You know, we, we start life now. Well, there's a whole eternity past. There's a whole eternity future, and I'm so excited. I can't wait to see what he has in store. So, you ain't seen nothing yet. <laughs> Don't you love my English? <laughs> okay, any questions uh, before comments? If you have questions, we'll get them, then we'll close in prayer, and then comments. Rowena. Yeah, when Pam was uh, talking about the branch and the vine, but all the verses that you quoted about that Semak branch, mm -hmm. they were all capitalized in my NASB. Very good, because it is speaking to, oh. sorry, my kitty's trying to get to the one who's allergic. <laughs> um, it, that's a good hint for you that we're talking about something, you know, we're not talking about a branch on a tree here. And we're not even talking about just a human being. We're talking about the Son of God, the very God himself, who made himself present as the branch, prophet, priest, king, all these different roles, servant. Wow. Wow. I don't see you. He's too big to fit in one picture. And not one picture can fully show us what it's trying to reveal to us because it's, it's less than. How can anything less than show us the greater? It, it just can't. It gives us inklings. It gives us a little foretaste. We're, we've gotten that sample and we've gone, ooh, I want the meal. <laughs> Give me the meal. I don't even just want the cherry on top. I want the meal. <laughs> and we're going to have forever to, to eat from that meal. So, okay, any other questions? Because I'll keep bouncing. <laughs> it just, it, it's hard to contain it. I'm going to close this in prayer, and then we can all explode. Lord God of creation, you are amazing and awesome, and your word is endless and deeper than the deepest oceans, higher than the highest heavens. And Lord, we are excited to hear and to see and to learn and to know what you have created for us. What you have for us, Lord, pales in comparison to you, though. And we cannot wait to be in the very presence of our ineffable God, to see you and to begin to understand you in a way that our new minds will be able to comprehend is the most exciting blessing of it all. For this, we thank you, and we pray for all to come to know the gospel that you revealed out of a heart of love in so many ways. 
And we thank you for showing it to us this new way in the stars. In your holy name, we give thanks. Amen. Amen. Okay, mic's open. Let out the hoots and the holler.